look, we're seasonally appropriate. Although given previous week's indiscretions, perhaps inappropriate may be more relevant. Hello Pickles, welcome to episode 12 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly across Instagram and Ravelry as Dungeon Knit. I'm a knitter living in London and if this is your first time joining us on the podcast, hello and welcome to you. Please be warned that this is a swearing friendly podcast and therefore the language is wont to get rather colourful. Um, but if you're an old hand at this sort of thing, if you've been here for a long old time and you know me and my antics well enough, Hello and welcome back. Thank you so, so much for coming back and joining us once again. We're in the midst of general festivities over here in the run up to Christmas, but um, don't let the uh, seasonal attire fool you. Um, we are by no means ready <laughs> for this general holiday season. Getting there, getting there. But um, yes, I just thought some, some self-enforced festivities would uh, help to make light of the whole general ah situation, but it's fine. For those of you who've been following along, Vlogmas continues. Vlogmas, for anyone unaware, is a general vlogging challenge that runs throughout December in the run-up to Christmas Day, so throughout the Advent period, where the um, general premise is to post regular updates and vlogs that are snippets from your day, how you're getting ready for the general festivities. And um, I will say that I'm on track at the moment for being daily. That was not what I expected. I thought I would have cracked out far before now. <laughs> but um, yes, I have been keeping them up to date. So if you do, and you haven't already, kind of followed along with me in checking out some markets, seeing a little bit more behind the scenes, including me talk a little bit about my stash wall, um, as well as just general preparation and lots of twinkly lights, then uh, please do feel free to check those out. What I will say is I do have uh, another couple of interesting days out and kind of special things planned, including one on the 23rd. So I'm going to be posting um, my second to last update on the 23rd. And um, for those of you who are particular fans of sweary sweariness, you may be interested in that one. So um, I will say no more, I'll leave it as a teaser for now. But um, if you're struggling to get into the festive spirit and you don't mind a little bit of casual swearing, then uh, that might be one that you want to check out. As we move through the month, so obviously this time next week will be Christmas itself. Um, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I will say that for some people here in the UK, myself very much included, um, Christmas is more of a secular holiday where we get to spend time with family and friends. Um, there's generally at least a couple of days off work, if not more. And um, then we get into the period that I affectionately know as Twixtmas, which is the period in between Christmas and New Year, which again, in the UK, is generally considered to be a period of, um, you know, friends, family, sloth, very much kind of letting our hair down after a long old year. And so I am intending to put a podcast out a little bit later than usual, so obviously it won't be around Christmas itself. I'm aiming to get one out later on that week, and then one more at the beginning of January. But I did want to highlight, so I will be starting a new job at the beginning of January. I've been in between contracts for a little bit and um, will be starting a new role in January and so need to work out my schedule around that. It is possible, if not indeed highly likely, that in January I might be doing alternate week updates for the podcast um, just while I'm finding my feet. My intention is to keep this weekly, but um, I hope you'll allow me a little bit of leeway and slack just while I start to get bedded in with a new role and get up to speed. Um, not least because I expect it will take a bit of a, a, a dent out of my knitting time as well. And uh, I want to be sure that I have some exciting content to share with you as well. I know it's definitely not ideal. I really enjoy checking in on a regular basis with podcasts, particularly those that come out weekly. Um, but having said that, I do appreciate now being on the other side of the lens and computer screen, so to speak, that um, it does take a huge amount of time. So we're talking about the best part of a full day in terms of preparation, writing some notes, getting the recording done, which usually takes at least a couple of hours, and then editing it. So for the whole process, you're probably looking at blocking out a day, which again, is fine and I'm happy to give. But at the moment, um, obviously I have a bit of a mix of priorities coming into play. And also try as I might, 
my landlord steadfastly refuses to accept like YouTube subscriptions, general amazing feedback, comments, interaction and just RAV group awesomeness as um, you know payment for rent which I think is just a bit rude but until she gives in I'm kind of stuck with having to work for a living so um, yeah sorry. Our knit along continues until the end of January so the Blame Dungeon Knit Along is our opportunity to take those knits that we've been lusting after and cast them on so that we're not living quite so vicariously through them anymore. Um, to those of you who've already started and are well underway and to those of you who've finished Thank you so, so much for taking part in the Cal. To those of you who haven't started yet, fear not, you have plenty of time and finishing is not mandatory. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details every single week. There'll be quite a lot of repetition. Um, I did talk through some of the details and some of the prizes on last week's episode. So if you happen to miss that, I'd recommend popping back over and checking that out. You can also find all of the details about it over in our Ravelry thread. And to that point, I want to say a massive, massive thank you to everyone who's been posting, not only on Ravelry, but also on Instagram, tagging me where you can. I just, I have so much fun looking through those posts. And what really makes me happy with it is that in casting on something that you've been lasting after a while, just the sheer amount of like delight and joy that is coming through in these posts, it makes me so happy. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm I'm so happy that everyone's kind of coming along with me and going for it because if I'm honest, seeing this much joy and um, sheer happiness, one, it makes me really fucking happy, but two, it just makes the burden of accountability so much easier to bear. So, um, thank you. And so with that, let's hop right into the show proper. As ever, you can find show notes for this week's episode in the description box below, as well as over on our Ravelry group, which you can find by searching for Knitting Vicariously in the groups tab over on Ravelry. You can also find us on Instagram. I have a Knitting Vicariously Instagram account that I use to post show notes at the end of each week's episode. So in there, there are links to the makers that I've mentioned, as well as any relevant hashtags. And it just gives you an easy way to follow along with someone who's caught your eye. And so without any further ado, let's get on to what I'm wearing. And what I'm wearing this week is a sweater that you will never have seen a mention nor indeed a sign of before because this is one I haven't shared previously in the podcast. It was knit a good few years ago now and this is my Ingrid sweater. Ingrid is a pattern by Isabel Kramer. Of course it is because it's a yoked colourwork sweater from a few years ago and um, she does a very, very good line in those. But um, this is, let me move my hair so you can see, uh, it's a fairly straightforward rounded yoke colourwork sweater. There is a little bit of colourwork on the hem, which I will stand up and show you now. Ingrid boobs. <laughs> of course, I say I'll stand up and show you now, but I'm conscious it might be quite hard for you to see. Let me just... Nope. You're going to have to bear with me. There it is. There it is. So you've got a little band of colourwork here, just round the base, round the hem. But for the most part, it is plain and really, really lovely. So I knit this out of, you're all going to be very shocked, very shocked, Madeleine Tosh DK Twist, because of course I did. <laughs> it is my go-to sweater yarn of choice. And as I say, because this was knit in a couple, a couple of years back, it almost guarantees that that's the base that I would use. I knit the large size, which is a 41 inch chest. I think my gauge was slightly off. Um, although there is a bit of negative ease, so maybe it's about right, but um, it is super wash. I do think it is also stretched a little. I will talk about that momentarily, but um, yeah, I will talk you through my colours as I go. So yes, the Ingrid sweater, and I will put a picture of the designer's item up here just so you can see, but um, it's a really lovely sweater. It is knit in DK weight. Um, it has full length sleeves. It is on my, I would say sort of low mid hip, that's a gauge of measurement that I choose to use today. And um, it just sits really nicely. It's got a little bit of shaping to it, I believe. Is the shaping at the side or at the front? The shaping is at the side from memory. Um, and again, the sleeves are shaped as well, coming to just simple one by one ribbed cuffs here at the bottom. Um, it is knit from the collar down, so there's no picking up for the collar. It's knit straight down. And um, yeah, it's a really, really nice knit. This was, I think, my first colourwork garment. Pretty sure about that. 
and um, I knit it back in 2015 as part of a knit along which in my case was a wholly virtual knit along that some wonderful friends and I were doing as part of their um, Rhinebeck sweater knitting and for all that I wasn't able to go to Rhinebeck I joined along so that I could live vicariously and also get a nice sweater into the bargain so um, I decided that I would do this my wonderful friends went to Rhinebeck they took amazing pictures I sat at home a little bit and sulked a little bit and gave myself a large glass of wine and a donut I'm pretty sure to, to kind of make up for it and um, it wasn't the same but um, luckily this year I was able to live my dream and so it was all good but um, yes this is a sweater from Rhinebeck's past if you will um, I mentioned it was knit out of Madeleine Tosh DK Twist. The main colour here is Astrid Grey, which is one of their really, really lovely neutrals. It is a very light grey. In terms of how it compares to Silver Fox, I would say this colour is slightly more flat. Um, and I mean that in the sense of it's not a particularly cool or warm grey. To me, it sits exactly in between. It is a true neutral in that respect. It's also not quite as variegated or as tonal as some of the greys that she dyes. And Silver Fox, to me, is certainly one that sits in that very silvery, as the name would suggest, cusp. Whereas this is definitely a light grey rather than silver. And if you have a look at some of the pictures over on Ravelry, I know there is a group um, which is... Madeline Tosh lovers as well as Madeline Tosh shop stalkers, um, both of whom have comparison threads. If you ever want to see some of those, you are always, always advised to go over there and have a look at some of the threads they have around those, which is what I've used in the past and I find to be incredibly useful. But um, yes, Astrid Grey. Um, I did alternate, although I did have one slightly different skein, which I'll come on to in a second. But um, yes, it's, as I say, Astrid Grey as the main colour. And then in terms of the yoke itself, if I could go back and change this, I probably would change the colours that I used because there's something about this yoke, because it is very red, yellow, blue, green. Sorry, I had to pause there for a little bit of cat craziness who just is running around going batshit crazy this morning as he is wont to do. But um, yes, if I could do anything differently with the sweater, I'd probably swap out at least one of the colours here. Not least because, sorry, my antlers are slipping as well. Oh, it's all going off today. Um, there's something about these that feels a little bit, a little bit primary school, a little bit childish. And I think it is just because they're very kind of red, yellow, green, blue. Um, I think if I'd gone for something maybe a little bit more complementary colours, um, perhaps a little bit less rainbowy, for want of a certain expression, um, I, I would like it a little bit more. It's not to say I don't like it, I really do. Just there's something about the colour work that doesn't feel quite right. I could have swatched the colour work. I didn't swatch the colour work. I know, you're all shocked, right? But um, but yeah, it's it's fine. I just, I would probably choose to do it differently now, knowing what I do. But um, in terms of what colours they are, so you're aware, so the greenish turquoise here is Hosta Blue, Hosta Blue, Hosta Blue. Um, we've then got Deep, which is this amazing, it's not quite a navy, it's like a very deep, very rich, deep, uh, saturated royal blue, almost verging into navy, quite tonal, really lovely, one of my favourites up here somewhere. Um, we have Candlewick, which is the gold, which again, I'm pretty sure is one of the skeins, I'm pretty sure it's that one there, um, which again, gold, lovely. Um, slightly more greenish tinged than some of the yellows that she does. And then the dark red is Venetian, and that is your true kind of really dark, winey, burgundy colour, which is lovely. Prone to bleeding, as is deep. Um, but I was quite lucky with these in the, I think I threw them in with a few colour catchers, which are, again, just sheets. They look a little bit dr like dryer sheets that you get, but they're not. They are just um, small slippets of paper that you slip in with clothes to stop them from bleeding in the wash. But um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure I just threw it in with a couple of those and crossed my fingers and hope for the best, because I like to live life on the edge. Um, so yeah, but as I say, misgivings aside, I think they work really nicely together. As I mentioned, I knit the size large, which is 41. Um, I do think it's stretched a little because all of these are super wash yarns. Um, okay, confession time. I've put this in a washing machine. But more than that, I've put this in the washing machine 
as part of a regular wash on a regular cycle at 30 degrees Celsius. <laughs> oh, come on, it's seasonally inappropriate. I had to bring back Kevin. <laughs> Um, yeah, I I have no shame about it, to be honest. I have no shame. Um, and so I, this is a super wash jumper. I put it in with a few other different things. Honestly, it has seen no ill effects whatsoever. I put it in with everything else. I let it go through a full cycle. I let it spin. Um, obviously, I didn't put it in the dryer. That would be madness. But um, I then just laid it flat on a drying rack to, to air dry and it was fine. And um, like I say, it's it's seen no ill effects whatsoever. I mean, it's super washed, so it, it might have stretched lengthwise a little bit, but I don't think it's grown too much anywhere else. And so, um, yeah, I would, I, I would do it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, would I do it with the world's most precious jumper? Probably not, um, but given how much DK twist I have, spoiler alert, quite a lot, day 14, I'm gonna say, of my Vlogmas videos, if you want to find out a little bit more about my sweater quantities behind me. But um, yeah, quite a lot of Madeleine Tosh DK Twist. Um, I, I wouldn't be too worried about putting those in with the wash again. So um, yeah, yeah, there we go. I mentioned too that I alternated skeins on the body of the sweater and that is absolutely true. What I didn't do however was alternate on the sleeves and of course as it turned out I had one skein that was slightly more variegated, you can just see the top of it here, where there is a tiny little bit of striping going on versus on this side where there is none. And again, if I were a more pernickety, precise person, this would bother me. It does not. <laughs> Not even remotely. So um, yeah, there is a slight more bit variegation in the sleeve. Let me hold it up so you can maybe see it a little bit better. Yeah, you can see that there's a bit of striping that goes on down here. But again, I meh, don't care. Um, and given the reaction that I had when I showed off my Sunday tier a few weeks ago that had the slightly different coloured cuffs based on where I picked up and knit down, I get the impression there's a few of you out there who also are similarly unbothered by it all. So um, it's good to know that I've found my people. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, life is too short to have absolutely perfect garments every time. This is far from perfect anyway, but certainly I love a lot of things about it. The slight, slight, slight striping on one sleeve that only really shows up in this kind of light. It isn't anything like as noticeable as this in general day-to-day -day wear. Meh, doesn't bother me. More details about this can be found over on my Ravelry page, which I will of course link in the show notes below. Um, general points, I'm pretty sure I used a 3.5mm needle for all the ribbing and a 4mm needle for any of the body of the sweater and the colour work. I've mentioned in previous weeks that I don't go up a needle size for my colour work. Some people have recommended that that's something you should do. Um, for me, my technique, because um, of the way that I actually knit my colour work stitches together. I am always stretching the stitches on my right hand needle when I'm carrying floats behind them, which means that for the most part my tension is pretty much okay. And so we move along to works in progress because very, very sadly, for all of us concerned, I don't have any finished objects this week. I'm really, really fucking close with one of them, which I'll show you momentarily. But um, I was hoping to bring it under the wire, but sadly, no such luck. I just had this terrible spate of gallivanting over the weekend <laughs> and in sort of tail end of last week where I was going out and doing things and meeting people and eating nice food and ugh it just it eats into knitting time that's what I say but um but yeah so I will share it with you um where I'm at with those just now and so the first of my works in progress this week is one that you are very very used to seeing by now it continues to live albeit bursting out of the seams in my little grey girl bag with the psychedelic squirrels, which is fast becoming one of my favourites, not least because it's really easy to spot. <laughs> I have one or two project bags here, as you may have established, but um, this one is never readily lost. So um, yeah, living in here is my fern and feather sweater, and I'm really close, really close to finishing it. Let me just hold it up so you can see. 
Look, look, I have only one bit of a sleeve left to go. And for me, sleeves go really, really quickly. Sleeves are kind of where my innate stubbornness sets in. <laughs> and I've been known to plow through them in the best part of the day. So um, yeah, it's, it's all right, we're getting there. But yeah, fern and feather, which let me hold up for you properly so you can appreciate. Isn't it nice? Um, this is, as ever, knit out of the Plucky Knitter Yak Paca, which I happen to have a skein of right here. It is a beautiful yarn. It's a blend of yak and alpaca, um, a 50-50 blend. It's a DK weight. It has a really interesting construction, which is to say that I'm pretty sure it's wool and spun, but it is definitely not plied in the way that a sort of standard uh, worsted spun skein would be spun. It's got a really nice texture to it. I talk frequently about the fact that it has sort of a slight fuzz, a few halo um, strands, maybe even a little bit of extraneous fluff that's in there, which is perfect for disguising all of that cat hair because my beast, he does shed. So um, yeah, it's, it's a really lovely yarn to work with. It's beautifully soft. There is not the tiniest hint of scratch that could come from it. Um, I know that there are people out there who are not big fans of alpaca because of its various different properties. I would say that this is a really lovely blend that might be an interesting one for you to try and consider. Um, the Plucky Knitter, the way that their updates work, it's always worth following them either over on Instagram or um, via their blog. I believe they have an app as well, but um, they do have a slightly different way of doing things, which is to say that they have updates every now and again where you need to go in within a certain time frame and place an order. It's all dyed to order, so quantities for the most part shouldn't be a problem as long as you get there reasonably close to time. Um, but also they have the Plucky Reserve, which is their um, their sort of readily available bases and colorways. It's usually quite a small selection, but you can go on there, go to the Plucky Reserve, and they will usually have at least a few skeins in there for you to order. Those of you who've watched in previous weeks will know that full credit for this sweater goes to my friend Meredith, because um, hers was a sweater that was knit in the same design, in the same colours, in the same yarn that I coveted um, relentlessly while I spent time with her at Rhinebeck earlier on this autumn. And so while we were out there, it just so happened very fortuitously that as we were sitting in the back of a taxi in the midst of what was a frankly kind of slightly harrowing journey from <laughs> our Airbnb to um, Boston Airport to pick up a new hire car, mostly down to the general kind of Boston driving and traffic, which I, I appreciate has, um, you know, a reputation and indeed a number of um, names for the drivers that are out there, which I greatly appreciate. But um, yeah, there were a few hairy moments on that drive, but I managed to distract myself by checking the plucky reserve and spotting that this yarn was in there. And uh, so it just made it really easy to get hold of. I'm so looking forward to having this done. Um, again, I've mentioned in previous weeks, I'm knitting the size 49 inch chest, which is gonna give me a good few inches of ease. I'm looking to have quite a relaxed, oversized sweater. Um, the sleeves are gonna be full length, perhaps even sort of bordering on kind of knuckles um, for me, which I'm fine with. I've done a one by one rib, uh, across here and across the hem of the sweater itself. Um, I also, oh, that is a good point to mention. Bind offs are a good thing to mention here. So in terms of stretchy bind offs for ribbing, I have tried quite a few over the years, but the one that I swear by time and time again is uh, a bind off that I found, which is called Laurie's Twisty Bind Off. And um, it's a really interesting one. I haven't seen anything like this elsewhere, but actually, it works for one by one or two by two or indeed any kind of general um, concoction for ribbing. But what you do is in between the knit and the purl stitches, you actually rotate the needle. So rather than moving the yarn front and back, you're actually rotating the needle in or under the yarn or over the yarn to um, add a little bit of extra, um, I guess, kind of space or, or extra yarn into that little bit of extra twist, hence the name think it through Caroline, uh, a little bit of extra twist into those stitches and that just adds a little bit of extra stretch as well so when it comes to then actually having a, a well-fitting um, 
cast off, it works really nicely. I have used things like Super Stretchy, Jenny Super Stretchy bind off over the years. I will confess that I found those flared a little bit for me, which is to say that actually the bind off ended up being slightly wider than the ribbing itself. Um, because I felt like I was building too much yarn into it. Whereas for me, this is pretty much perfect. Now, I could have faffed around over three or four rows in advance and then I could have done a tubular bind off. I do love the look of those, it is stunning. Um, but I think when you've got a good few hundred stitches on the needles and you're at the bottom of the ribbing for this, the thought of trying to negotiate uh, a bind off that requires sewing, that requires you threading the needle that's the right length of yarn, and then having to go through all the stitches, which certainly for the first half of the hem, there's a lot of yarn to pull through a lot of stitches. Um, I wasn't feeling it. And again, in all honesty, where it's not on the neckline as well, because it is, as you will have seen, a rolled neck up here, I wasn't too fussed about having something that matched. And so yes, I have my, I think these are 12 inch circulars, which are very much my go-to. These and 16 inch circulars, I love using for sleeves. They make it go so quickly. I'm not a big fan of Magic Loop. I'm definitely not a big fan of DPNs. I find both of them quite fiddly. Um, I find Magic Loop in particular, I spend so much time pushing needles through and back um, that the style I have, it works really nicely with the smaller circular, smaller circumference circulars. Um, and so yeah, I can zip through these fairly quickly. Um, I've got my little progress keeper from the corner of craft as ever, which is my little holiday Starbucks cup. Um, and that for me is just den is denoting the row where I picked up the stitches for the sleeves so that I can count from there on down and count my decrease rows as well. But um, yeah, I really, really think I'm going to have this done for the next podcast in between Christmas and New Year. So my Twixmas podcast, I'm going to be wearing it there. I said it. I said it. I laid the gauntlet down. You can hold me accountable to it. It'll be fine. When I spoke to you last week, I mentioned that there was some yarn I'd purchased for a new cast on. And um, I'm delighted to say I have actually gone right ahead and cast it on. So living in my Tane Casey bag here, which is a smaller pouch of hers, which she incredibly, incredibly kindly and deeply unnecessarily gifted me um, as part of the package that came over with some of the prizes for the knit along. Again, if you want to see those in more detail, pop on over to last week's podcast and you will see those beauties over there. But um, yeah. I love Tani's bags, I have a good few. This is my first of her pouches and I love it. And I have a little look at the fabric that's on here. It's all kind of tropical birds and toucans and parrots and prettiness. And there's this gorgeous little orange zipper. And then inside it's fully lined with her canvas lining and her little logo up here. But in here, before I give the game away entirely, is a very small amount of knitting that I managed to do yesterday when I was out on my uh, trek across London. And um, when I say very small, I do mean very small. But I showed you last week that I had been over to Tribe, which is my local yarn shop here in London, in uh, Richmond, which is in southwest London. And I had picked up a couple of skeins while I was there for a Pompidou shawl. Pompidou is a new pattern that has been um, designed by Karen Fernandez, who works over in Tribe. It's a gorgeous big garter squishy shawl. I'll put a picture of it up on here. One of the key traits about it is it has these tiny little cute pom-poms and I, I couldn't resist. It's, I'm not a big shawl knitter. Um, I don't normally gravitate towards them. Certainly garter shawls. I need something with a little bit more interest in it from time to time, but there was something about this. I put it on, I put it on and I wore it and I was like, yeah, I have to fucking knit this now. It's just, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it grows on you. Not literally, very figuratively, very, but um, yeah. And so here is my fledgling Pompidou shawl. It is still very little. Here we have it. And so yeah, there, there's not much that's going on just yet, but as you will hopefully be able to see, scooch forward a little bit more. Here we are. So this shawl is knit, it is predominantly in garter stitch, but as you will see, it alternates between um, some kid silk mohair. So in this instance, I am using 
So this top strand here is Shibui Silk Cloud in the graphite colorway. And then this strand here is Spectrum Fiber Sock Yarn, their 8020 Sock Yarn in the slate colorway. In fact, no, sorry, I tell a lie. It's not 8020 at all. It's 7525, um, as there is a bit of Sparkle and Stellina in there. And sorry, I'm holding this really badly. Um, one thing you might be able to see is there's a little bit of interesting texture in there as well. What I hadn't appreciated is that the edging stitches, um, that there is a twist to them which is really interesting. It's not just bog standard back and forth um, garter stitch. There is a bit of texture and interest in there too, which is really, really lovely. Now, what I will say is that that extra texture stitch does make it a little bit interesting trying to do it on the tube. <laughs> <laughs> because um, working with Kid Silk Mohair, very, very fine yarn, and trying to do some sort of interesting textured work with it as well, is uh, not, the, not the easiest of things, but I'll tell you what, this is already knitting up so lovely and soft. I'm really, really happy with this. So I am knitting it on the recommended needle size, which is 3.5, which is a US size four. I'm knitting it on my Chaogu needles, and at the moment, I think this is a 22 inch cable. Um, I could probably have started with a shorter one, but I figured, yeah, sod it, let's go straight into it. Um, this shawl is, it's very, very long, corner to corner, but it's quite shallow, so I'm not expecting to need a massive long cable in order to work it, because obviously I'm gonna be growing it more in length than I am in terms of its width, but um, or depth, rather, depth. But yeah, I'm still really enjoying how this is working up. It's so soft, so soft. Um, and obviously a large part of that, well, predominantly that is down to the um, Kid Silk Mohair, which as I mentioned in my case, I am using the Silk Cloud. It's a little bit finer than some of the other mohairs out there on the basis that um, a lot of the mohairs that Indie Dyers use for a 50 gram skein, you'll get somewhere in the ballpark of around about 450, 440 to 450 yards-ish. Um, Shibui Silk Cloud, they sell 25 gram skeins and for that you get around about 360 odd ish um, yards from memory and um, so that means it is perhaps a little bit finer, a little bit lighter to work with um, but it is also beautifully soft so their um, silk content is much higher than some of the other indie dyed ones. Indie dyed as a maximum you tend to see around 30% silk yarn Shibui Silk Cloud is 40% um, and obviously 60% Kid Mohair. So um, it is lovely and soft. And for me, I really, really like the variegation that this is coming up with. You can see that it is perhaps a little bit more um, tonal than the original. The original is, it uses the, the Kid Silk Mohair by Spectrum Fibre as well. So it's dyed in the same colorway. Whereas this, the gray, let me hold up the skein so you can see them, that might be more useful. Um, the grey of the Kid Silk Cloud, sorry, the, the Silk Cloud, the Kid Silk Mohair, you can see that that's obviously a little bit darker than the main colour of the Spectrum Fibre. Sorry, I'm working with slightly different lighting today, so it's a little bit difficult to not get the shade from the camera in there. There we go. But you can see, and there's obviously a fair bit of sparkle in this one too. But yeah, really enjoying how this is working up. As I say, I wasn't necessarily expecting to cast on a shawl, but um, it also felt like really nice, appropriate travel knitting. Now, as I mentioned, it is a little bit fiddlier than I had anticipated uh, when I decided to work on it on the tube. But um, that said, I think by the time I get my rows a little bit longer, it's gonna be a lot easier to manage. And um, I'm still gonna be pay playing it a little bit fast and loose with the uh, cabling on the tube. It is cabling with a cable needle, which obviously involves you, you know, literally shifting your stitches, lifting them off the needle. Um, which I'm pretty fine with for the most part on sugarly sugarly tube trains. Definitely a little bit, you know, kind of ups the ante a little, ups the difficulty level, shall we say. But um, yeah, I'm really enjoying working on this. And then last but not least on the whips front, I am continuing to work on my granny stripe blanket. My granny stripe blanket, as I showed you a couple of episodes back um, for just fold it in such a way that I can show you it properly. Um, 
So as I mentioned when I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago, I bought a Nora George advent calendar, a yarn advent calendar last year and managed to put in a couple of stripes on this blanket every day last year when I opened them. So um, they are in order. So starting with not quite the, the chain and foundation row, but the row immediately above. I have the full advent calendar of yarns in order put into the blanket with the last one being this reddish pink, the sort of rose pink colour here on the top. Um, anyone who's unsure, it's all, sock, it's all sock weight yarns, so they're all kind of fingering weights. I used a four millimetre hook. Arguably I could have used a 3.5 millimetre. I don't know what that is in letters. I'm not a crocheter. Um, as the raggedy raggedy edges on this blanket will very much attest but um, yeah it's it's somewhere in the region of 300 odd stitches I don't know but um, yeah it's not really I guess a, a sort of firm and fast pattern it's very much a, a general set of guidelines if you will but um, yeah it's just it's a really really simple blanket as I say I've got 20 gram skeins mini skeins for each of the different minis that come out that gives me enough to do two rows on this with the, with the hook size I mentioned, as well as leaving me some little nubbins left over, um, which I can then put into my granny, not my granny stripe, this is my granny stripe, into my cosy memories blanket at some point, because uh, I have one of those too, and that's been languishing a fair old while now. But um, yeah, so they, they work really well for that. They, they sort of cover both the balances, if you like. But um, over the last year, I have picked this up periodically and put a few more rows into it. As I mentioned last time, I think I put in 12 rows or 12 double rows from the green immediately above the pink up to this variegated black here. I went through those when I talked about this last time a few weeks back, if you want to know the detail. But since then, I have been working on this on pretty much a daily basis and putting in my minis from my A Homespun House advent calendar. That's an advent calendar that I also bought last year. <laughs> but as I've mentioned previously, it didn't arrive until February. I then promptly forgot all about it. And so I've been deciding to add those in first and um, come back to my advent calendars that I've been opening this year um, later on. So let me just hold up this. And so everything from this row upwards, this is the row that I mentioned I've been working on this year, is again in order of the days as and when I've opened them, my homespun house um, advent minis from this year. So let me just hold it double again so we can just see the colours a little bit better. So we've got, here we are. So we've got this lovely kind of green and slightly sparkly shimmery reddish yellow uh, we've got another kind of almost like a violet and yellow strand here and then a slightly moodier reds and greens and yellows and then above that quite a vibrant green some orange and corally colors and then you've got a kind of mint and white split then there is this section here which is very dark and moody and um i really like it if I were more precious about it, I'd be a little bit, annoyed. well, as it is, I'm a little bit, meh. Um, it's fine. I just wish it wasn't all together in this one single chunk. So there's so many kind of light and pastel-y colours the whole way down through here that I kind of wish they'd broken up this section a little bit more. But that is the randomness of it all, as you say. So uh, again, there's kind of this like moody, dusky rose colour. There's then a kind of sea like a sea greens and navies and all those kind of blues. There's then sort of gold and like what I call like bumblebee colors. So it's golds and, oops, there we go. Um, golds and blacks with some oranges in there too. And then almost kind of like a moody, I want to call this like a moody circusy colorway. <laughs> Cause there's all these kind of like reds and yellows and blues, like moody primary colors. Um, there's then some really pretty purples and blacks in those two rows there back to the kind of mint greens with some pinks in there too, a little bit more of the pink. And then lastly, we've got the kind of like clementini, melony, orange and greens up at the top there too. So there you have it. I'm one day, oops, hello. Um, I'm currently one day behind. I didn't have a chance to catch up with this yesterday. I was editing last night's blog instead, vlog rather instead. But yesterday's, which I will be adding, is this one here. 
which again is kind of reds, unbleached or, or kind of undyed patches and some blues and some purples. And then I've also, hi, um, and then I've also got today's mini that I opened, which is some really fun yellows. And um, by the time that this goes up, I will have at least one more. So um, yeah, I need to make sure that I'm keeping up to date with it. It does take me a fair old while in terms of kind of each row. I wanna say each row takes me maybe 20, 25 minutes. It's, it's not fast, but as I say, there are about 300 and odd um, sort of stitches that I chained originally. So there's a fair few things to go through on it, but um, it's growing pretty quickly, which I quite enjoy. It's probably, I would say, almost halfway up the double bed now, if you lay it kind of slightly overlapping the bottom edge. So um, yeah, I'm getting there with it. I'm definitely getting there, but um, I, it's quite meditative. It's quite nice to work up. I'm not a crocheter by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm not really sure that I would favour it over knitting and I don't say that as a means of being any way down on people who happen to crochet it's just for me knitting is what I do very naturally the crochet blanket is lovely because it's a different way of working up some of these minis it works up quite quickly I really enjoy it um I don't know if I saw a pattern that I really liked I'd probably look to see if I could crochet it but um I'm, I'm not particularly well versed in it by any means and so those are my whips for this week. Moving along into vicarious knitting, I've been doing a little bit of that because, you know, you can't get towards the tail end of a sweater and not be thinking about what you want to work on next. So I think I've got a couple of ideas for my next cast on. I know that the Eesbra sweater, which is by Ellie of Skein Deer Knits, is definitely one that I want to look at. I've talked a little bit in the past about the yarns I might use. And so I think that might be next up on my needles. Um, I'm also thinking about another sweater that's stranded with mohair because I know I've got one on the needles and I know I need to get back to it and I know all it needs to do is to go into the freezer and so that I can rip back that mohair and start alternating and I will get to that. I definitely, definitely will. But um, I saw, so I'm going to guess it was on Instagram because that's generally where I tend to see these things and they sort of plant a little seed in my brain and then kind of days later I'll turn around and go, Ooh, ooh, I quite like that. Um, one thing that I know I definitely don't have, well, I say one thing, there are many things I definitely don't have, but um, one sweater that really kind of jumped out at me, can't remember it, can't include a link to it, but it was in this really beautiful, soft, heathery, slightly lavender blue colour. And it was a very, very soft colour. And it's not a colour I've got really in my stash or in my wardrobe and it's a colour that I absolutely love. Um, I say I don't have it in my stash, I might, the closest I have to it might be one of the Volmeiser skeins, so it's just this really soft, slightly kind of lavenderish blue colour. It's a really, really lovely shade. I would pull it out but it would risk upsetting the matrix and um, I don't want to do that today. But um, yeah, so I was thinking quite a lot about kind of finding these colours and it just so happened yesterday, Urgh, cruel world, that I happened to pop over to Loop which is a wonderful yarn shop in North London, in Angel, central North London and um, you know I was I was thinking about this sweater and I had some ideas in my head and I didn't find the perfect combination but I found one that was really very interesting so let me just grab that for you. Now, before you start the universal condemnation and, you know, say, but if it wasn't perfect, why on earth did you buy a sweater's quantity of it? I didn't, rest assured. What I did buy was one skein of the, what I would use as the mohair and what I would use as the kind of main yarn as well, just to consider how they would work together. And dare I say it, possibly even swatch. I'm not even comfortable saying that, so we'll have to see whether or not that actually happens. But um, the two yarns that I had picked out were these two here. So let me just pop them up. <laughs> right, this isn't meant to be as, as kind of sweary as it's gonna look, but. <laughs> um, for people in the UK, or, or for people outside the UK rather, um, holding two fingers up in this direction is, is 
essentially like giving someone a one-fingered salute. It's kind of a very similar thing. I know in the US it has no meaning at all when people hold these up as kind of a meaning of two. In the UK it, it kind of has to be that way around because that way is considered to be quite rude. Um, just so you know. But um, yeah, let me hold these up so you can see. I really, I can't get over that I'm doing this to the camera. Right, um, on this side here, we have some of the Isager Silk Mohair, and this is in their colorway 44, which is, you know, aptly named, I'm sure. But um, it's a lovely, lovely soft blue color. It is 75% kid mohair, 25% silk, and a 25 gram ball that has around 212 meters. And then on this side here is Jameson's, and this is the Shetland Spindrift, so not Jameson Smith, but Jameson. And this is in the, I believe it's the Clyde Blue colorway, which let me just check to see if there is a number. Yep, it's Clyde Blue and it's number 168. And again, it's a really lovely soft blue. It's slightly heathered. Really, really pretty. And so dare I say it, I might even swatch, but this is a colour, it's a colour that I absolutely love and it baffles me that I don't have anything in my wardrobe that is this colour um, because for all that sometimes um, knitting with blue can feel like a neutral sometimes, I say this as someone who wears a lot of jeans. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful podcasters out there who have incredible senses of style, who um, make beautiful dresses, I'm thinking of a few in particular. Um, my general aesthetic is top and trousers. Um, and so I wear a lot of kind of jumpers, of kind of nice tops, particularly to work in the summer months as well. Um, but generally, you know, it's either a pair of jeans or something that is pretty close to being a pair of jeans that I tend to wear in my bottom half. So having a blue sweater can sometimes feel a little bit kind of much if you're also wearing jeans. Um, but I reckon this is a soft enough blue for it to be able to work if I'm wearing sort of navy trousers, maybe even black, oh blue and black. But um, yeah, it, I think it'll work really nicely. So my only reservation with any of this is how the fabric is going to work up with these two held together and so hence I might want to think about going down the, the swatching route just to sense check that. Um, worst comes to worst, I do have some alternatives for the uh, main colour here, for the Shetland. Um, I know, I mean, I've mentioned Volmiser here. I did think about potentially using Volmiser Blend as the main yarn. Volmiser Blend is there. Technically it's sport weight, but for me it really knits up as a fingering weight. Certainly I can knit it at that gauge. I quite like it when it's knit up at that gauge. Um, and that held with the silk mohair would be rather luxuriant. But um, yeah, I, I will see. I, I've got high hopes for this because I really, really do like the heathering that's in this blue. So hopefully that will work out. So uh, I might be I might be swatching at some point soon, which doesn't feel like me. And I, I don't think I'm coming down with it, I think. Seasonal flu? But in a move that is infinitely more like me, I also have <laughs> some pretensions to a colourwork hat. I know, right? You're all shocked. Um, so yes, I haven't cast on with any of the La Bianime or any of the House of Alla modes that I picked up earlier in the month when I was over at a yarn story in Bath. Um, I've still been thinking about patterns for those, but as I was thinking about patterns, there was one other one that crossed my eye and um, crossed my eye, caught my eye. That's the expression that I'm using. Um, crossed my palm, no. <laughs> that caught my eye and um, in looking at that yeah I've kind of fallen in love with that one a little bit so there is a hat and I am going to butcher the name of this because while I may be Scottish this is in a dialect that I am not familiar with at all so I'll put it up here on the screen for you to see as I just mangle along with it um, so I'm going to go with the the Stramesund hat let's try that um, the Stramesund, which is a pattern by Donna Smith. Donna Smith is based in Shetland, which is a stunningly gorgeous part of the world that I have not visited, despite being from Scotland. Um, and I desperately want to get there at some point. But um, this, this is a really beautiful pattern. I don't even really know what the technical term or, or what the kind of true term is to describe it. It is it is a stranded hat pattern. It's it knit with colour work, but it's not your kind of traditional more sort of fair isle looking that you would perhaps anticipate from that part of the world. It's a really, really gorgeous, very simple, quite monotone um, knit and I kind of fell in love with it and I want to knit it in colours that are very, very similar. And so while I was in loop, because just loop and 
I'm just not very good with temptation, particularly the irony persuasion. Um, I was having a look at colours. Now, you know, it's not as though I don't have enough whites and greys to choose from. In fact, I have scrap whites and greys that I could almost certainly choose from. But, guys, wool folk, softer than kittens, softer than kittens, and certainly more pettable than my cat when he's in full on raging mode as he is right now. <laughs> but just, just look at them though. So this is wool folk, let me double check, this is wool folk far. And I will hold them up for you to see. There we go. So it is the chained construction, as you can see, which is just beautifully soft. There is a lovely halo that's coming off it as well, which you can hopefully see here too. It's 100% Ovis Merino, which is, again, I, the fact that it doesn't have kittens in here is frankly a shocker to me, but um, it's just beautiful. And in terms of the colorways, this here is number two, so it is zero two and the grey on the other side is 04. Um, and just, yeah, I think there's enough contrast here to make it interesting. I didn't want to go with the pure white. Um, I just, I don't really like brilliant white in a hat. It's just a little bit too close to, you know, kind of my face for me to feel as the white is quite the right colour. So to have something that's slightly off-white for me feels far more wearable, um, not least because I'm only going to get makeup on it because that's what happens with me in hats. Um, but then yeah, there's enough contrast between the two for that pattern to stand out really nicely. I did get a second skein of colourway number two, which is here, um, because I do want the pom-pom and I want the pom-pom out of the yarn. I'm not entirely sure how the wool folk far with the chain construction is going to work up with the pom-pom. That could be a little bit interesting, but um, yeah, we'll have a go and see. But oh, seriously, seriously though, this needs to happen. And so those are my vicarious knits this week. We're gonna take a little look once again at your knit along projects, the projects that you're working up as part of the Blame Dunder knit along and bloody hell far, you are storming it this week. We've got more FOs that are starting to crop up in the FO thread over on Ravelry and just the, the tags that I'm seeing, the conversations that I drop in on over in the Ravelry group and the chatter thread, they are just making me so happy. As ever, I am struggling to keep pace with it, so apologies if I seem a little bit absent. No, please, that I do skim through, that I'm reading, that I am ogling all of your project pictures and just delighted that you're taking so much joy out of this and so without any further ado this is an Instagram week so let me share some of the projects that have caught my eye over on Instagram using the blame dunder knit along hashtag.
they're just incredible, aren't they? Aren't they? It makes both Ravelry and Instagram just such happy places for me to go and while away a little bit of time and get far too distracted and far too enabled and it's just ugh, it's just all the joy and I love it. And um, I know that some of you are in the midst of gift knitting and obligation knitting. I know for some of you as well, that gift knitting is not obligation knitting. It's things that you really love to do. And so again, if there are patterns that you're casting on that you love, then by all means, feel free to enter them. It doesn't have to be something that's selfishly for you. That's just my thing. I'm not impressing that on you. <laughs> but the main, as I say, the main um, prerogative with all of this is that it is something that you're desperate to cast on that you really want to knit up and so feel free to join us and to um, take part in what is frankly just a really really wonderful community experience. And so that's it for this week. As ever, you will be able to find show notes in all of the places, so in the description box below, as well as over on the Ravelry group, where you can find the chatter thread for the knit along, the FO thread for the knit along, as well as the episode thread specific to this episode, which is number 12. You'll also find episode 12 over on the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account, where I'll link to all the makers and the hashtags that are relevant to this week's episode. And um, yeah, please do continue to feel free to use the Blame Dungeon Knit Along hashtag for all things related to the cow, the general Knitting Vicariously hashtag for anything related to the podcast. And if you do feel the need to include pictures of my giant face, feel free to do so. I will, um, yeah, deal with them as and when they arise. <laughs> Um, you can also post a little bit more around knits, patterns, projects, yarns that have caught your eye in our Show Us Your Vicarious Knits for December thread over on Ravelry. Again, a wonderful destination for all things enabling. And so for those of you who celebrate, I hope you have a wonderful festive period. Certainly here in the UK, um, Christmas is obviously still first and foremost a religious holiday but has also been fairly well established culturally societally and so um, for even for those of us who aren't religious it's a very kind of secular holiday but a good excuse for us to let our hair down after what has been a bit of a year um but obviously for those of you for whom perhaps Hanukkah has just passed or you don't celebrate a holiday at this time of year I hope you enjoy perhaps a slightly quieter week than you otherwise would do and so I wish you a very happy rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled. But if for whatever reason it isn't, I hope you have the opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on. I will raise a little festive tipple to each and every one of you this year. Thank you so much for making the last few months just really fucking awesome. And um, I will see you again next time. Bye. And so yes, let's move along into what I am wet. Oh, my horns are slipping. Antlers are slipping, not horns. These are not horns. If they were horns, I'd definitely be making more inappropriate jokes than I am right now. <laughs> oh, crumbs. Yeah, let's not, let's not go to the roots again. I, I have a cat who's on high alert here today. There is another cat that has been sighted within vicinity of the cat lab. I know, I know, it's, we're on lockdown, it's, it's touch and go whether we'll make it, if I'm honest. Yeah, he's just zooming around like an absolute bloody nutter today, so um, yeah, apologies for that. If you do hear any background noise, then that'll be why. Oh my, am I filming you? This is fine, Hobbs. Don't mind me. <laughs> that was an elegant 180 that you did there, buddy. Cats, ma'am? What the hell? <laughs>